Let's pray. Our beloved Heavenly Father, once again we come into your presence with gratefulness in our hearts because we know that you're a loving God and you want us to know how things will unwind in the last days so that we can be prepared. We ask that as we study this evening the last portion of the third angel's message, that your Holy Spirit will be with us. Help us to understand the urgency of the times in which we're living and help us to understand what the final punishment of the wicked and Satan and his angels will be so that we can admire and love your character. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to begin by reading Revelation chapter 14 and verses 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. In our presentation last time, we discussed the first part of the third angel's message. And I'm going to read that portion and then uh, do a little review, and then we'll begin with what we're going to study in our lecture today. It says there in Revelation 14, verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, that is, followed the first two angels, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And of course, we studied yesterday that Jesus Christ drank the wine of the wrath of God from the cup, the cup that his own father gave him. And Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God for everyone on planet earth. But the sad thing is, those who refuse to receive the third angel's message will have to drink the cup of God's wrath, the wine of God's wrath themselves, because they rejected what Jesus Christ did for them when he came to this earth. What a waste. They could have been saved, but instead of following Christ, they chose to follow the Antichrist. And by the way, we have studied that the Antichrist does not mean primarily against Christ, but it means one who seeks to occupy the place of Christ. So the third angel's message says that those who worship the one who seeks to occupy the place of Christ and the image of that beast, which we've already studied, and receives his mark, those are going to receive the wine of the wrath of God because they did not accept Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, but they chose to follow a counterfeit. They chose to follow the beast who is a counterfeit Christ on earth. And then we read, continuing in the third angel's message, the following. This is the middle of verse 10. He shall be tormented... That is, those who receive the mark of the beast, who worship the beast, who worship the image, who receive the number of his name, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So the culmination of the outpouring of God's wrath is found when fire and brimstone falls from heaven and consumes those who worship the beast, his image, and receive the mark of the beast. So what we're studying is a matter of life and death. You know, it, it's not an optional thing. Well, you know, uh, I will uh, choose to accept the third angel's message or I'll choose to reject the third angel's message. The fact is that if we accept the message, we're going to be saved, and we're going to survive, and we're going to have eternal life because Jesus drank the cup. But if we follow the beast and receive his mark and worship his image, we're going to be lost. We're going to drink the cup of the wine of the wrath of God without mixture of mercy. And the Bible tells us that this is going to be the culmination. The fire and brimstone is going to be the culmination of the punishment against the wicked. 
Now I want to dwell especially in our lecture today about what forever means because you notice here that it says that the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And there are other passages in the Bible that speak about eternal fire. Notice for example Matthew 25 and verse 41. Matthew 25 and verse 41. Uh, this is a very important passage, it's the parable or the story of the sheep and the goats when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats. It says there in verse 41, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Once again the fire is called what? Everlasting fire. The fire and brimstone is an everlasting fire. Notice Matthew 25 and verse 46, Matthew 25 and verse 46, just a few verses further down. It says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so you have everlasting punishment, you have eternal fire, you have no rest day or night. Does this mean that those who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark are going to burn forever and ever and ever and they're never going to go out? I want you to notice also Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. We're going to answer this question that I just formulated and we're going to take a look at what Scripture has to say, not tradition. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. It's speaking here about the devil. It says there, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and what? See there it is again, fire and brim. Is the devil going to suffer uh, the unmitigated wrath of God? Is he going to have to drink the cup of the wrath of God, the culmination of the drinking of the cup? Absolutely. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, really the tense of the verb is where the beast and the false prophet were cast. That's the, the antecedent verb so shows that they were cast into the fire immediately before the beginning of the millennium. And then it says at the end of the verse, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now does this mean that the wicked are also going to burn in the fire forever and ever, and the devil and his angels are going to burn in the fire forever and ever? They're going to continue drinking the cup of God's wrath forever, where they'll never go out? Is that what Scripture is trying to teach? Well, that's what we're going to take a look at, especially in our study today. In order to understand what we are going to look at today, we need to understand what Scripture means by everlasting fire. Now you'll notice that Scripture does not say that the wicked will burn eternally. Scripture says that the fire burns eternally. There's a distinction. The fire is eternal fire, but it doesn't say that the wicked are eternal. We're going to notice that that's a very significant distinction. Now what is the eternal fire? Well, in order to understand it, we need to go back to an Old Testament story, the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So I invite you to go with me to Genesis chapter 19 and verses 24 and we'll also read verse 28. It says there, Then the Lord rained, notice this, brimstone and fire. Is this the same expression we find in Revelation? Most certainly. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. And where did this brimstone and fire come from? From the Lord out of the heavens. Is that where the fire and brimstone comes in Revelation? Absolutely. Verse 28, we'll jump from verse 24 to verse 28. Notice the smoke ascends once the cities are burned with fire and brimstone. It says, Then he, that is Abraham, looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. Does Revelation also speak about smoke going up? Absolutely. So Revelation speaks about fire and brimstone, it speaks about smoke going up, and it speaks about the fire and brimstone coming from heaven. Now go with me to Jude verse 7, and we only give the verse because uh, Jude only has one chapter. So Jude verse 7, 
And let's notice what kind of fire destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a particular type of fire that destroyed these cities. The fire and brimstone that fell from heaven and the smoke went up like a furnace. It was a certain kind of fire. Notice Jude 7. It says there, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, these cities are set forth, forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What kind of fire destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible says that it was eternal fire that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was eternal fire and brimstone, if you please, because we just read that fire and brimstone fell from heaven upon the cities. Now I want you to notice a text that appears to be in contradiction with Jude 7. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, and I underline the word appears because there are no contradictions in the Bible when you study carefully. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. Speaking about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, it says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. What were Sodom and Gomorrah reduced to? They were reduced to ashes, but they were destroyed with what kind of fire? They were destroyed with everlasting or with eternal fire. Now the question is, are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? Sodom and Gomorrah are not burning today, so eternal fire must mean something different than what most people assume that it means. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The question is, what is the fire that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? We need to go to a few other texts in the Old Testament that explain what that fire is. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Here, Jesus, uh, here God is warning Israel uh, not to practice idolatry. And notice what it says. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which He made with you. And make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. In other words, don't make any idols. And then it says in verse 24, the reason why you should not make these idols, for the Lord your God is what? Is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Let me ask you, what is God? God is a what? A consuming fire. So we begin to understand what the fire is. The fire is whom? God, according to this. Now you're saying, is God then a bunch of flames of fire? No, we're going to notice that God is fire in a specific sense. Now go with me to Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, where this uh, verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 24, is quoted in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now why should we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear? Notice, for our God is a consuming fire. Who is the consuming fire? God is the consuming fire, according to this. Now, does this mean that God is composed of flames of fire? Of course not. Fire uh, means something concerning the nature of God, who God is. I want you to notice Exodus chapter 24 and verses 15 through 17. In our last lecture, we noticed that God and sin cannot exist together. That's why God ultimately has to eradicate sin from the universe, because holiness and sin cannot coexist. Now I want you to notice Exodus 24 and verse 15. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now, praise the Lord that there was a cloud that covered the mountain, or else Israel would have been wiped out. Continue saying in verse 16, Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now notice this, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a what? 
a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. What is it that is like a consuming fire? The what? The glory of the Lord. Let me ask you, what is it that destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? The fire and brimstone that fell from heaven was a manifestation. For a moment, God withdrew the veil that covered him from Sodom and Gomorrah, seeing him, and immediately the cities were totally destroyed. Go with me to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. Here it's speaking about a sea, a crystal sea in heaven where God lives. And I want you to notice a very interesting detail concerning this sea of glass. It says in Revelation 15 verse 2, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with what? Mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Here you have this crystal clear sea, which is, it looks like it's mingled with what? With fire. Do you know why it looks like it's mingled with fire? Because as you read in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the throne of God stands immediately above the sea of glass. And undoubtedly the glory of God is reflected in that sea of glass, and therefore the sea of glass looks like it's mingled with fire. So in other words, God is a consuming fire. The glory of God is a consuming fire against sin. And of course we've already studied that the glory of God also has to do with His character. And the wicked have a character totally opposite than the character of God. Therefore the glory of God when He reveals Himself consumes the wicked. Now let me ask you, if God is the consuming fire, and the consuming fire is the glory of God, how long has God had this glory? I suppose He got it just 6,000 years ago. Of course not. How long has God been a glorious God? He's been a glorious God forever. So let me ask you, can we speak of God as everlasting fire? Or He has everlasting glory? Absolutely. So it is God as the fire who is everlasting. Does that mean that that which the fire consumes is everlasting? Never in the Bible will you find that what the fire consumes is everlasting. People just assume that because the Bible uses the expression everlasting fire or eternal fire. But it's the fire that's eternal because God is eternal. His glory is eternal. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to show from Scripture that the wicked are going to be destroyed. Notice Malachi chapter 4, and we'll read verses 1 and 3. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 3. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yea, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall what? Burn them up. What does burn them up mean? It means that it just burns and burns and burns and burns. No, to burn up means that ultimately it what? It goes out, exactly. And so it says, And that day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Who is the root? Who is the root of all evil? Satan. And who are the branches? The branches are his followers. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The devil is the root, and the branches are his followers. And now notice verse 3. It says, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be, what? Ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. What are the wicked going to be? They're going to be what? Ashes. How can they be ashes and still be burning forever and ever? It's impossible. What are ashes? Ashes are the result of everything there is to burn. Once the fire has burned everything, the result is ashes. And the fire what? The fire goes out. But let me ask you, does the source of the fire go out? Absolutely not, because the source of the fire is the glory of God. Notice also Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, a very interesting expression. Revelation 20 verse 9, speaking about the wicked surrounding the holy city, it says, They went up on the breadth of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. 
and fire came down from heaven, from God, out of heaven. See, the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire came down from God. See, it originates with God, out of heaven, and what? Devoured them. You say, what does that word devour mean? Well, I'll just give you this reference. Matthew 13, verse 4, speaks about the parable of the sower, and it says there, And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. How many seeds were left after the birds finished devouring them? Absolutely none. It's the same word that's used in Revelation. To devour means that the fire totally eats them up and totally destroys them. Notice Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, what this fire produces. It does not produce eternal life in misery. It says in Revelation 21 verse 8, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with, there it is again, with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do you know what second death is? Second death is simply that death from which there is no resurrection. You see, everybody has been born into this world is living their first life, or has lived their first life. Those who die in Christ, when Jesus comes, they'll resurrect, and they'll live, so to speak, their second life. They'll live for the second time. But the wicked will all die before Jesus comes, or at the coming of Jesus, the rest of those who are alive, and they will remain dead during the thousand years. After the thousand years, they will what? They will resurrect, and then they're going to be judged by God, as we studied previously, and then they're going to be what? Destroyed with the fire, and that is called what? Second death. You can't have a second death unless you had the first death. So how many deaths are God's people going to suffer? Only one death. How many deaths are the wicked going to suffer? They are going to suffer two deaths. In fact, Jeremiah 51 says, they shall sleep an eternal sleep, and they shall not awake. Now, this might surprise you, but the Bible teaches that it's the righteous who are going to live in the midst of the everlasting fire. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. You saying that the righteous are going to hell? No, I'm not saying the righteous are going to hell. I'm saying that the righteous are going to live in the midst of the presence of God. They're going to live in the midst of the eternal fire, and they're not going to be burned because they have a fireproof character. You say, where does the Bible teach such a thing? Go with me to Isaiah 33, verses 14 and 15. Isaiah 33, verses 14 and 15. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. And then the question is asked, Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who can dwell with the, with the devouring fire? Who can dwell with the everlasting burnings? What would most Christians say? The sinful, wicked people. But notice the answer that Isaiah gives. He who walks righteously and speaks the truth, who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing what? From seeing evil. Isn't that interesting? The Christian world has it the wrong way around. They say that the wicked are going to live in the fire forever and ever. The Bible says that the righteous will live in the presence of the eternal fire forever, and they will not be burned. They'll be like the three young men that were cast into the fiery furnace. You see, they had the character of Jesus Christ, and therefore the fires did not consume them. That was a common little ordinary human fire, but we're talking here about the devouring fire of the glory of God, and God's people will be able to dwell in the midst of the devouring fire and not be consumed. Now you say, well, pastor, if you say that Satan and his angels and the wicked are not going to burn forever, the question is, are they going to burn for a short period, for a long period? How long are they going to burn? Is everybody going to suffer the same length? 
Well, do you know the Bible tells us that the punishment upon the wicked will be according to their what? According to their works. Let's notice Luke 12, verses 47 and 48. Luke 12, 47 and 48. This is a parable of Jesus, and he says, And that servant who knew his master's will, and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, shall be beaten with what? Many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things, committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with what? With few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to him uh, to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Let me ask you, is the final punishment going to be according to the sinfulness of the individual? Absolutely. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. This is after the millennium. It says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to his what? According to his works. So the punishment that is going to be meted out is according to the works which were performed by the individuals who are lost. Let me illustrate the point. How many of you think that it would be just on the part of God to punish Adolf Hitler and a common ordinary sin in, sinner with the same punishment? Would that be justice? That would absolutely not be justice. That would be like an individual who goes before a ju judge because he's gone through a red light, and another individual goes before the same judge because he killed somebody, and the judge says, I condemn both of you to the electric chair. You know, the punishment de uh, depends upon the works that the individual has committed. This means that Satan and his angels and the wicked will suffer differing lengths of punishment according to their sinfulness or according to their works. Now you say, but what about forever? Doesn't the Bible say that they're going to burn forever and ever? Well, we've already noticed that they're going to be reduced to ashes, so they must not burn forever. So what does forever and ever mean? Well, let's read the text again. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, really, were cast, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You say, what part of forever and ever don't you understand? Well, I decided uh, one day that I would go to the uh, library, the theological library at Andrews University in Michigan, and I would look at what commentators have to say about the words forever. In Hebrew, the word is olam, and in Greek, the word is ion. And so I decided I would see what the experts in Hebrew and Greek had to say about these words that are used forever and ever, and I discovered something very interesting. These scholars say that forever means a long period of time whose end cannot be seen, but it does not mean that the period of time does not have an end. Allow me to read you some statements uh, from some of these scholars so that you see what the expression forever means. And by the way, uh, the version in Spanish, the Reina Valera of 1960, says for centuries and centuries, actually por los siglos de los siglos. Literally in Greek it means for the ages of the ages. Now let's read a statement by Alan McRae. He's pre he was president and professor of Old Testament theology at the Biblical School of Theology in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. Notice what he had to say. The LXX, which is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint generally translates olam, that's the Hebrew word, by ion, that's the Greek word, which has essentially the same range of meaning. He's saying that olam and ion mean the same thing. Now notice this, that neither the Hebrew nor the Greek word itself contains the idea of endlessness. See, neither one of these words contains the idea of what? Endlessness is shown both by the fact that they sometimes refer to events or conditions that occurred at a definite point in the past. In other words, they're not eternal because they had a point of beginning. And also by the fact that sometimes it is thought desirable to repeat the word, not merely saying forever, but forever and ever. Also, two other scholars, Moulton and Milligan, they are experts in Greek. Notice what they have to say. In general, the word, the word ion, 
where you get the word forever from in the New Testament, in general, the word depicts that of which the horizon is not in view. In other words, the horizon is distant. Whether the horizon be at an infinite distance, or whether it lies no further than the span of Caesar's life. In other words, the word forever is used for the span of Caesar's life. But it's also used, especially with regards to God, in terms of eternal distance, that which has no end. But it refers to God, it's not referring to corruptible, created things. One further statement from Gerhard Kittel, who uh, was the editor of the famous theological word book of the Old Testament, he had this to say, in the plural, ion, that's uh, the word forever, the, the ion formulae, the meaning of ion merges into that of a long but limited stretch of time. So notice the word means a long but what? Limited stretch of time. In particular, ion, that's the word forever, in this sense signifies the time of duration of the world. So the word forever can mean the period of duration of this world. That is to say, time as limited by creation and conclusion. So the word forever can mean the time between creation and conclusion. He continues saying, at this point, we are confronted by the remarkable fact that in the Bible, the same word, I own, is used to indicate two things which are profoundly antithetical. Namely, the eternity of God, see, from, from God's perspective, the eternity of God and the duration of the world. Now is the duration of the world limited? Yes. Is the eternity of God something that has no beginning or end? Yes. But the same word is used for both. Now what does this mean? It means that when the word I own is used with reference to God, it means everlasting. But when it's used with reference to created things, it means a long indefinite period that definitely has an end. He continues saying, this twofold sense, which Ion shares with the Hebrew Olam, see both the Old Testament and New Testament words share this, this idea, points back to a concept of eternity in which eternity is identified with the duration of the world. So how long is eternity? The duration of the world, says this scholar. Now the question is, is Satan going to burn out? He's obviously going to burn a long period of time because the expression forever is used with regards to his destruction. It doesn't mean that he's going to exist forever and ever and ever throughout eternity. He's going to burn forever and he's never going to go out. It means that he's going to burn for a long period of time whose end cannot be discerned or cannot be seen. As it says in the Spanish version, por los siglos de los siglos. Now, do you know that the Bible says that Satan is going to be reduced to ashes as well as the wicked? Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 28 and verses 18 and 19. Ezekiel 28 and verses 18 and 19. Here is a prophecy speaking about this covering cherub, cherub who was beautiful. It says, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It what? What's the next word? It devoured you. And it turned you to ashes. Is the devil going to be reduced to ashes? Yes. So is he going to burn out? Absolutely. So it says, I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror, horror and shall be no more forever. In what sense is the fire everlasting? In the sense that the glory of God is everlasting that destroys Satan, but also the fire will destroy Satan and he will never exist forever. Are you understanding? In other words, the fire produces everlasting results. But even after Satan goes out, God will still have his glory. He is still the consuming everlasting fire. We've already read that God is going to eradicate root and branch. Let's read that again. Malachi chapter 4, and we'll read verse 1 and then verse 3. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, 
and all the proud guess all who do wickedly will be stubble and the day which is coming shall burn them up says the Lord of hosts that will leave them neither root nor branch the root is the devil and the branches are his followers verse 3 you shall trample the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this says the Lord of hosts but now I'm sure that you're wondering how long the devil and his angels are going to be burning. How long are the wicked who will drink the cup of the wine of the wrath of God without mixture of mercy, how long are they going to be burning in the fire before they actually burn out and cease to exist? The answer to this question, particularly with regards to the devil, is found in an ancient ceremonial that God established in the Hebrew religious system in the Day of Atonement ceremony. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 7. And you remember in our last lecture I asked the question, did Jesus suffer the second death? We said that the second death is death from which there is no what? No resurrection. Did Jesus resurrect? So did he suffer second death? No. And let me say it this way. Jesus suffered the experience of second death. He felt like the wicked will feel outside the holy city when they realize that their life is going to be snuffed out forever and they will forever cease to exist. Jesus felt the anguish of separation from God, the anguish of knowing that, 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 that his life was coming to an end. In fact, in Desire of Ages, that magnificent book, it says that he could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. He thought that sin was so great and so offensive to his father that the separation from his father would be eternal. In other words, Jesus felt the anguish of everlasting separation from God, but the sins that he bore were not his. The sins that he bore were the sins of the world. So you say if he didn't suffer second death, then uh, sin wasn't paid for because the wages of sin is death, second death. Well, here's where the ceremonial of the Day of Atonement comes in. Leviticus 16 and verse 7. Speaking about two goats that were chosen on the Day of Atonement, it says, He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So two goats were chosen. One goat was for the Lord, and the other goat was for Azazel. Now let me say that in, that in Hebrew thinking, in Jewish thinking, in fact if you go to the apocryphal book of Enoch, you'll find that the Jews believed that Azazel was the prince of demons. They believed that Azazel was the devil himself. And now I want you to notice Leviticus 16 verses 20 to 22. But before I read these verses, let me ask you this question. What happened in the daily ceremonial in the sanctuary? And an animal was sacrificed. What happened with the blood? The blood was taken into the sanctuary and sin was transferred from the sinner who put his hand on the head of the animal. And then the animal was slain and then through the blood the sin was transferred where? Into the sanctuary. So let me ask you, were those sins that were transferred into the sanctuary forgiven sins? Yeah. The sins that Jesus transfers to the sanctuary are forgiven sins. Isn't that comforting news? You know, he's not registering those things up there to hold them against you. What God is doing is he's introducing sin into the sanctuary covered by the blood of the sacrifice, covered by the blood of Jesus. In other words, forgiven sins are placed in the sanctuary. And what did that do with the sanctuary? It contaminated the sanctuary. It defiled the sanctuary. If you don't believe it, read Hebrews 9 verse 23. It says that the heavenly things had to be cleansed. Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 says, Unto 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. In other words, all of the sins that went into the sanctuary through the blood, eventually those sins had to be cleansed from the sanctuary. Notice Leviticus chapter 16 verses 20 to 22. This is what happened on the Day of Atonement. It's, and, and this is a very important point. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, that is of atoning for the sanctuary, let me ask you, the scapegoat ceremony, did that take place after the sanctuary had been cleansed or did it take place 
before the sanctuary was cleansed. After the sanctuary was cleansed, after the first goat had been sacrificed and died, the first goat represents the sacrifice of Jesus. In other words, after the first goat was sacrificed for the sins of the people, the, the high priest cleansed the sanctuary and then he came to the second goat. So it says, and when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring the what kind of goat? The live goat. So whatever is done with this goat, this goat is not dying for sin, this goat is what? Alive. And without shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. Verse 21, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat. Which, let me ask you, which iniquities, which transgressions, and which sins was he placing on the head of the scapegoat? All of those that he was bringing from where? From the sanctuary that had been deposited there all year. And by putting his hands on the head of, goat, of the goat and confessing the sins on the head of the goat, what is he doing? He's transferring the sins to Azazel, the live scapegoat. And it says, uh, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send him, send it away into where? Into the wilderness. So where was he sent? Into the wilderness. Notice, by the hand of a what? Of a suitable man. There was a special person chosen to take him to the wilderness. The goat shall bear on itself, notice this, all the iniquities to what? An uninhabited land. A wilderness and a what? Uninhabited land. In other words, a place where there was no one living. And he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Now let me ask you, what happened with the sins of those who had not placed their sins in the sanctuary? Those who had not actually repented of sin and confessed their sins. Were all, were all of those sins placed on the head of the scapegoat? No. Notice Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Those who did not claim, listen to this, this is important, those who did not claim the blood of the Lord's goat, those who did not confess sin and repent of sin and have their sin go into the sanctuary covered by the blood, those individuals suffered the penalty for their own sins. Their sins were not placed on the head of the scapegoat. In other words, they died for their own sins. Notice Leviticus 23 and verses 29 and 30 where it says this very clearly. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will what? Destroy from among his people. So it was only all of the sins that entered into the sanctuary through the blood, sins that had repented of, that people had repented of and confessed that were placed upon the head of the scapegoat. And then the scapegoat was sent out into the wilderness to a non-inhabited land. What was God trying to teach through this? I want to read a couple of statements from a woman who wrote some amazing things. Uh, her name is Ellen White. You say, why are you reading from Ellen White? Well, I'm going to read her statements and I'm going to tell you where in the Bible is found what she says. Because she definitely knows what she's talking about and she has the backing of Scripture to explain this specific point. The first statement is found in Early Writings, page 290. This is something that she wrote very early in her ministry. She says this, Then I saw thrones, and Jesus and the redeemed saints sat upon them, and the saints reigned as kings and priests unto God. Let me ask you, where is that found in the Bible? Revelation 20 and verse 4. During the millennium, God's people will reign as kings and priests with Christ. And it, the Bible says that judgment was given to them. Notice what it continues saying. Christ, in union with His people, judged the wicked dead. Is that biblical? Judgment was committed to them, it says in Revelation 20, verse 4. 
comparing their acts with the statute book, the Word of God, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. Is that biblical? Yes, Revelation 20 verses 11 and 12 says that they will be judged according to their works. Now notice, then they meted out to the wicked the portion which they must suffer according to their works. Is that biblical? If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, which we're not going to take the time to read, it says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? It even says, Do you not know that the saints will judge angels? It has to be the wicked angels, because righteous angels need no judgment. And so she says, once again, Then they meted out to the wicked the portion which they must suffer according to their works. And it was written against their names in the book of death. Satan and his angels were judged by Jesus and the saints. That's biblical. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Now listen to this. Satan's punishment was to be far greater than that of those whom he had deceived. Is that just? Is that justice? Absolutely. He was, it says it was going to be far greater. Now what does that mean? In intensity or in length? Let's continue reading. Satan's punishment was to be far greater than that of those whom he had deceived. His suffering would so far exceed theirs as to bear no comparison with it. That seems to give the impression that he might be even suffering for centuries. Now, I'm not putting any time period on it. But she says it will, that his punishment would far exceed theirs as to bear no comparison with it. Does the Bible say that the devil is going to suffer for a very long period, forever and ever? Yes, that means an extremely long period of time, whose end is not in view. And then she continues saying, After those, all those whom he had deceived had perished, Satan will uh, was still to live and suffer on much longer. You say, why is that? Why would that happen? You know, that's, some people say, oh, that's terrible that God would do that to the devil for such a long period of time. Let me tell you what, it's much better than believing that God is going to cast the devil and all of the wicked in the fires of hell, and they're going to burn forever. That's not justice. Justice would be that each one is pun punished according to his what? according to his works. Is the devil more guilty? Yes, he's the originator and he's the instigator of sin. Now there's another statement, this is an amazing statement, that's found in early writings, pages 293 and 294. She says this, I saw that some were quickly destroyed. Who would be the ones that are quickly destroyed? Those who led sinful lives, but you know, they were not sinners in the sense of Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein or any of these dictators that have the blood probably of hundreds of thousands on their hands. She says, I saw that some were quickly destroyed while others suffered longer. They were punished according to their deeds done in the body. That's biblical. Some were many days consuming. No, some of the wicked were many what? Many days consuming. And just as long as there was a portion of them unconsumed, all the sense of suffering remained. Let me ask you, is this going to be torment? The Bible says that they will be tormented. Yes, absolutely. For a very extremely long period of time, there's going to be torment. Don't think that it's, that it's not going to exist. The torment is not going to be, I don't think primarily, the pain and the anguish of the fire. It's going to be the anguish of knowing that their life is going to be snuffed out and they're never going to be able to live again in the presence of God. And so it says, some were many days consuming, and just as long as there was a portion of them unconsumed, all the sense of suffering remained. Said the angel, the worm of life shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched as long as there is the least particle for it to prey upon. And now notice this, Satan and his angels suffered long. And why did they suffer long? Why do they suffer much longer than the wicked? Why is it described as forever and ever, which means an extremely long period of time? You know, the existence of the world, like we notice from other, some of those scholars, uh, is, is used, the word forever, to describe the time span of the existence of the world. 
Notice, Satan and his angels suffered long. Satan bore not only the weight and punishment of his own sins, but also of the sins of the redeemed host which had been placed upon him. Is that biblical? Where is that? In Leviticus 16. All of the confessed sins that went to the sanctuary were the ones that were brought out, out and placed on the head of the scapegoat. By the way, where is this fulfilled? It's fulfilled in Revelation chapter 20. When a powerful angel descends from heaven, that's the fit man of Leviticus 16. And the devil is exiled in a world that is a wilderness, in a world where all of the wicked have died, a non-inhabited land. This happens during the thousand years, during the millennium. And then, of course, he's destroyed after the millennium. And so it says, Satan and his angels suffered long. Satan bore not only the weight and punishment of his own sins, but also of the sins of the redeemed host, which had been placed upon him. And he must also suffer for the ruin of souls, which he had caused. Then I saw, now here's the good news. This is different than what most Christians believe. Most Christians believe that, the devil, that God is going to put the devil in the fires of hell and he's never going to go out. And the same with the wicked. But God is a just God. Then I saw that Satan and, and all the wicked host were consumed. And the justice of God was satisfied. What is this about? Is, this, is God wanting to torture the wicked? No. This is about meeting out what? The punishment that they deserve according to their works. It has to do with God's justice. And remember, at this time there's no mercy, because the door of mercy is closed. This is the unmixed wrath of God, according to what the third angel says. Then I saw that Satan and all the wicked hosts were consumed, and the justice of God was satisfied. And all the angelic host and all the redeemed saints with a loud voice said, Amen. Said the angel, Satan is the root, his children are the branches. Is that biblical? Absolutely. They are now consumed root and branch. They have died a what? An everlasting death. Is the fire still burning at this point? See, that was a tricky question. The fire is still burning because the fire is whom? God. But are the wicked still burning? Absolutely not. Said the angel, Satan is the root, his children are the branches. They are now consumed root and branch. They have died an everlasting death. They are never to have a what? A resurrection, and God will have a clean universe. Is that a beautiful way of looking at it? Absolutely. You say, well, isn't that mean for God to do this? Let me ask you, did Jesus drink the cup of the wine of God's wrath for every single one of these persons? He most certainly did. But you see, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you accept the Antichrist instead of the Christ, you must drink the cup of the wrath of God. Because you did not receive the gift that Jesus bought by drinking the cup of God's wrath. Are you understanding the third angel's message? It's a matter of life and death, death folks. The third angel's message is a dire warning because God doesn't want anyone to worship the Antichrist or his image or to receive the mark of the Antichrist. By the way, this destruction is called in the Bible God's strange act. Because God is a creator, God is not a destroyer. Notice Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 21. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perazim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome, the King James Version says, his strange work and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. So it's unusual and strange for God to destroy, but justice requires that he destroy because these people slighted and rejected the mercy of God. So the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, that fire will descend from heaven, and the fire will devour the devil and his angels and the wicked. They will suffer differing lengths of punishment, but eventually they will all go out. And let me ask you, where are they punished? Are they punished in some corner in the universe somewhere? No. It says that they gathered around the city on the breadth of the earth, and fire fell from heaven. So let me ask you, where do they receive their punishment? They receive their punishment on the earth. Can the fire be everlasting in terms of them being burned everlasting? No, it can't be. Do you know why? Because the Bible says that God will make a new heaven and a new earth. 
How can he make a new earth if the wicked are being consumed and being burned forever and ever on the earth around the holy city? I'd like to end by reading a statement that we find in that majestic book, Desire of Ages 107 and 108. It says, To sin wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. In all who submit to His power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. See, that's what God wants to do now. He, through his, his, the fire of the Holy Spirit, He wants to consume sin. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it. Is this true of the wicked, that they become identified with sin? They personify, personify sin, just like Satan. She says, then the what? The glory of God, that's the fire, the glory of God which destroys sin must destroy them. Jacob, after his night of wrestling with the angel, exclaimed, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Why was he able to see God face to face? Notice, Jacob had been guilty of a great sin in his conduct toward Esau, but he had repented. His transgression had been what? Forgiven, and his sin purged. Therefore, he could endure the revelation of God's presence. But wherever men came before God while willfully cherishing evil, they were destroyed. At the second advent of Christ, the wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. Now notice this, the light of the glory of God, this is what the fire is, the light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. Did you understand what we studied tonight? Isn't it simple? People make things so complicated. So there is a certain sense in which the fire is everlasting, because God's glory is the everlasting fire. But there's another sense in which the results that the fire produces is not, are not everlasting, because the things that are burnt up by the everlasting fire cease to exist. They're reduced to ashes. I pray to God that we will follow the Christ and not the Antichrist that we will have Jesus drink the cup instead of us having to drink it.